So just a little bit more to say uh, from the sort of variable oxidation states part of the specification, if you're following that, and that's about redox titrations. You've had lots of experience doing titrations by now, so we're not going to talk about how to do a titration. We're just going to look at titrations in the context of doing a redox reaction with it rather than a simple acid base uh, Larry Bronsted type reaction. So like any titration, what's it all about? Well, it's about determining the quantities that are reacting. Yeah, it's all about moles, voles and concentration, voles being a volume in cubic decimeters once we start calculating things. It doesn't have to be just acid base typical chemistry uh, that can be done that, that you have to do with the titration. Any reaction in solution you can quantify by titration, provided as a sensible and easily attainable end point. Um, so you know when to stop adding from the burette, basically. Provided you've got a, a tangible end point, then you can do a titration on that reaction. As you well know, we use indicator for um, we use indicator for acid base titrations because normally we're dealing with colourless solutions and. Uh, the indicator obviously changes with the pH profile, you know, about titration curves and such. Uh, because we're dealing here with redox species, now anything could potentially be a redox species, but here specifically a transition metal species changing oxidation state. And as we've talked about, you know, they're often quite colourful and the colour changes with oxidation state change, with ligand change, coordination number and such. Then actually we don't need an indicator here most of the time. Uh, the examples we'll look at never need an indicator because the colour of the metal species itself changes and that acts as our indicator. It's redox, so we're talking, as you know, oxidation state change, not just simple Lowry Bronsted acid base type um, reaction. Fine, so acknowledge that. But we don't use an indicator because, well, for a start, a pH indicator would be useless because the pH doesn't change very much necessarily. Um, it's, it's all about the colour of the species present that gives us our indication for when the reaction is complete. So let's have a look at the picture there. I'm sure you've already glanced at it. There we've got some potassium manganate or permanganate being added from uh, a burette to a solution. We've got two examples of reactions to consider uh, on the course. Both involve manganate being added from a burette typically, um, from being, being used in general, but usually it's from the burette. Uh, and the two species that we'd consider normally to be in the conical flask, i.e. reacting with the manganate, would be iron 2 and uh, ethane dioate, which isn't a transition metal species, evidently. So just like any titration, we'd, we'd do it. We'd start our initial, final, therefore titer for our volumes. We'd repeat for concordant results. We'd do all the, make, take all the necessary measures for making sure the results are accurate, i.e. swirling, rinsing down the size with the ionized water. We'd do a good titration. When it comes to doing the calculation and we need mole ratio, it would be half equations to be used to get the reacting ratio. I and mean, sometimes we deal with, well, quite different reacting ratios uh, to what we'd normally get in an acid base reaction, where it's normally one to one, one to two, or one to three. So uh, our first example uh, of a redox titration is the manganate iron two titration. I'm going to leave that picture up on the board just so you can visualize what that might look like. What do you think that manganate, manganese, well, you can work out the oxidation state. What do you think manganate is going to turn into when it gets reduced? It's an oxidizing agent. It's a famous oxidizing agent. So it's going to get reduced itself then. And also bearing in mind what you've come across historically, what you might have noticed on the previous video, if you're looking really carefully, what do you think iron 2 could possibly turn up into? What higher oxidation state could it reach? So if you need any more time to think, then it's time to pause the video. I'll tell you then. Uh, the manganate gets reduced down to manganese 2. That's the lowest it can go without going down to elemental manganese. The manganese 1 is incredibly, well, I've never come across any compounds that, that show it. So manganese 7, which is what we've got in MnO4- minus there, reduced down to manganese 2 as per that half equation. It's a 5 electron reduction, 7 down to 2. Uh, H plus is needed to carry off those oxygen atoms from the manganate ion, uh, forming H2O. There we are, great. What about iron 2? We're going up an oxidation scale. Its limit really is iron 3. Um, you, you very rarely come across any oxidation state iron higher than iron 3. Uh, but yeah, there we go. So I want you now to quickly, and hopefully with little difficulty, combine those half equations to get a full equation. Pause the video. Hopefully it takes you not very long at all. And then here's the answer. 
So yeah, I've just combined those half equations by doing what we always do. Five iron twos makes five iron threes, i.e. if uh, quintupled, if that's the right term, the iron, iron, iron two, iron three equation, so the electrons match, and, and there it is. So our reacting ratio between manganate and iron two is one to five. But this has to be done in the presence of H plus ions because they're a necessary part of this reaction. If the H plus wasn't there, then actually manganate could still re reduce iron two, sorry, oxidize iron two. However, it would make a different species. It would make manganese dioxide and it's a whole different sort of set of conditions to consider. So this must be acidic. That's the one we're talking about. So a couple of practical considerations then for doing this reaction before we do a practice question. An excess of H plus has to be there. It's not an acid base titration. A pH indicator would just show it's strongly acidic and the acidity would go down slightly as the reaction continued because H plus would be being used up. But you really need a good excess of H plus there because otherwise we're talking about really slow rates of reaction and all sorts of issues that might develop from there. So H plus is necessary. So we'd normally uh, make up one of our solutions, typically be whatever ends up in the conical flask um, in sulfuric acid. So rather than dissolving any solids that we may have or diluting any solutions in just water, we'll dilute it in aqueous acid. So one molar or half molar sulfuric, basically just make sure there's an abundance of H plus. So there's more than enough present. As we've already said, there's no indicator. We're gonna think about the colors specifically now uh, because these transition metal species have color. But it means that we need to bear in mind when we're doing a redox titration, um, what the end point is that we'd expect to see and how we're going to know when to stop adding, basically because you see a permanent change. So what about those colours? Now, these are colours uh, that, that, again, you should know. Uh, these are examinable. We're going to get on to iron hexaqua complexes and other similar species and what their colours are later anyway in the course. Uh, but here is one that pops up now. Iron 2 hexaqua is green. However, if you've ever seen a bottle of it, it's very, very faintly green. It's not standout green. The hexaqua iron 3, which gets formed. Now, yeah, I appreciate violet and yellow are nothing like each other. They're nowhere near each other on the sort of colour continuum. Um, there's more to it, as always. If it's actually hexaqua iron 3, it's very, very pale violet. It's so pale, basically it looks colourless. Sometimes it what's called hydrolyzes. We'll talk about it when we get to the final installment in the transition metals topic. And it turns into a similar but not quite the same species, which is yellow. So it, it's a colour, but it's always a very faint colour uh, in a titration like this anyway. And then you've got the manganese hexaqua 2 ion, which again is basically colourless actually. It's very, very pale pink. If you do colorimetry on it, you could look at what wavelengths it is absorbing and you'll see that basically the resultant color is pink. What it doesn't absorb adds up to pink, but it's so pale that you, again, it basically is colorless to the, to the naked eye. And in the concentrations that we typically be working with when doing a, a redox titration, uh, it ends up very dilute by the end of the reaction. So those products are diluted and, and very, very pale indeed. Okay, fine. So what would the end pipe actually look like then? Can you imagine? You've got a pale green species and a strongly purple species. You can see it in the burette up there. It's very, very purple. Um, turning into, um, well, a very pale color and another very pale species. Well, overall then, at the end point, if you've nailed it and it's absolutely perfect, we always had a drop too much in a titration, remember though. Then a solution that only contained iron three, manganese two in aqueous conditions, so we'd assume hexaqua, look essentially colourless or very, very pale mixture of those colours, violet, pink and possibly yellow. But as always with a titration, we have to add one drop too much. In a pH acid base titration, that's because we have to add a drop too much to push the titration curve up to the top of the inflection. Here, as we've said, it's not acid base, it's, uh, it's something else, it's redox. But the idea is that you're going to add one drop of manganate too much from the burette. And so that manganate colour will persist. So we'd be adding that purple colored manganate to the reaction flask, to the conical flask, and that pink color would disappear as it gets used up in the redox reaction. As you get close to the end point, the rate of reaction is slower because there's less iron two per unit of volume, i.e. the concentration is close to zero. So the manganate takes longer to find the iron two, i.e. collide with it and react. And, uh, and so the color persists, but eventually goes back but that one drop too much just over the end point, and it's always that way in a titration, 
means that the manganate colour persists. So we get that permanent pale pink colour. Now, yeah, manganate is strongly purple. However, here we're adding one drop into a conical flask that's just had a lot of other solution. Um, I was about to say neutralised, that would have been wrong, wouldn't it? Redoxed or iron 2 has been oxidised in it. Um, and so it's just one drop in a big conical flask, so it appeals faint pink, basically. But it's the manganate colour persisting. Let's do a practice question then, and then we'll look at the other um, redox titration combination that you need to be aware of. So this is time for you really just to pause the video now. I'm, I'm not going to give any hints. I'm just going to say come back when you're ready for the answer. Take your time over this. It's just a titration calculation. But um, the examiner finds nice tricky ways of testing us in a, in a slightly more challenging way than year 12 acid base titrations because they because we can basically. So uh, I'm not going to say any more. Uh, read the question carefully. I want you to get a complete answer for steps one and two before you listen to the answer. You've got to try. It's, you know that it's, you're going to get the answer in a minute anyway, but you need to practice this. So come back when you're ready for the answer. Pause now. OK, so here is uh, a bit of working out then to talk us through it. Uh, all these numbers get repeated on the next slide, but uh, just take note of what there is. There's a bit of a trap that I've laid out for you here, uh, but this is the sort of thing we need to be able to do with. We've got 25 cms cubed of iron 2 solution, and then we're also adding 20 cms cubed of acid. Is that relevant or not? Does 45 mean anything? That's 20 plus 25. It doesn't. Let's have a think about that. So... Here we are, it's a standard moles, voles and conch titration type calculation. Uh, first of all, then I'll take the information from the question. We add 25 cms cubed of iron 2 solution, not 45 cms cubed. OK, we'll come back to that in a second. The titer, quite small here, there'd be quite a high percentage error in that because of the um, small titer. It should be closer to 25 or even up to 50. And the concentration of the manganate was given. If you didn't get 25 cms cubed there divided by 1000, then go back and work this through with the correct answer. I just want to take a minute to explain why it's not 45. 25 cms cubed is the solution, uh, sorry, it's the volume of the iron 2 solution. So 25 cms cubed of iron 2 was put in, basically. The acid was added. I gave you this extra detail because it, to make it seem relevant, ultimately that's just saying, look, some H plus was put in and you can assume it's an excess because it always would be, unless it's a very badly planned experiment. So the volume of iron 2 solution going in was 25, and then they did something to it that didn't, it diluted it, but it's still 25 cm cubed worth of this iron 2 substance. So it was 25. Anyway, better move on in case you actually didn't get that wrong in the first place. So there's what we took from the question. Now I've got a volume and concentration of manganate there. So vol times conch gives us a number of moles, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of manganate added from the burette. 1 to 5 reacting ratio here, so 3.2 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of iron 2 was in that flask. Now the volume of iron 2 solution that we took was 25 cms cubed, so that's the volume to consider. Moles over voles gives us 0.128 moles per dm cubed. You can see that my units are shown there, so 0.128 moles per dm cubed of iron 2. Great. There was another part to this question, though. it asked us what mass of iron 2 was in the solution. And I wondered if this would throw many of the students. Um, so let's have a think about it. The fact that it's iron 2 means nothing because the electrons that are missing, their mass is negligible. So when I work this out, I've just got mass and moles, basically, mass MR and moles to deal with. Periodic table reminds us that the uh, relative atomic mass for Fe is 55.8. The lack of two electrons is irrelevant because, as we said, their mass is negligible. So it's still 55.8. Uh, despite the lack of two electrons. So mass times uh, moles, sorry, moles times MR even, or AR here. Uh, now, it's the moles in the sample, isn't it? All right, we're told it was 25 cms cubed, so there's the number of moles. We don't need concentration here because that's per dm cubed, and anyway. So multiply by that, you get 0.179 gram. The question asked for it, for, uh, asked for it to 3SF, so there it is to three significant figures. That could be an A-level question. I mean, it's the sort of thing you've done in year 12 with acids and alkalis. Um, here it is again with redox um, put on it instead. Next example then. Now, uh, this is uh, a molecule, or sorry, an ion that we've met before. We've met it as a ligand, and here it is now as a, as, as a reactant in the redox titration. 
So manganate and ethane dioate reacting. Ethane dioate is commonly also called oxalate. Your examiner would always write ethane dioate into a question because that's the sort of systematic name and, and we follow the systematic naming system for, for our course. But oxalate is very, very commonly actually what it's called. And if you do a few chem sheets practice questions, which you will be doing if you're in my class there or any other class for that matter, then um, you, you might hear it called oxalate. I've got a more difficult question for you this time. Now, um, before we get onto the titration calculation, uh, let's work our way through the half equations again. I'll tell you this time, manganate oxidizes ethane dioate up to CO2. So yes, that can act as a ligand for some metals. It won't act as a ligand on manganate anyhow, though it'll get oxidized by manganate up to CO2. I want you to write two half equations then for the reaction that would take place when we titrate these against each other. You've already done the manganate one, but see if you can do it off the top of your head quickly without looking back. Oxalate, um, it's not too bad. You've just got to decide what to do. So any more time, you better pause, uh, which you will need. So pause now. Okay, and now unpause hopefully and ready to go through the answers. So manganate getting that reduced down to manganese two. You've got to know that it's manganese two that comes from manganate and therefore that's the half equation for its reduction. Ethane dioate turning into carbon dioxide is very simple to balance. It's two CO2s from a C2O4, two minus. By charge alone, it means there must be two electrons uh, coming out of the um, of the species that gets uh, oxidized. The oxidation state of carbon in CO2 is plus four. You can work out the oxidation state of carbon in uh, ethane dioate there is plus three. So it's a, an oxidation two points up the scale. Next thing to do is to combine. I hope that you've already done that. So uh, there's a times five and a times two step in there because then we've got 10 electrons in common. So doubling the manganate half equation gives us two manganates, 16 H pluses and two manganese twos. Times five for the oxalate half equation. Yep, five C2O4s makes 10 CO2. So the numbers are getting pretty big in our balanced equation. That's fine, that's completely correct. Now uh, I've just noticed there, there's a negative sign missing. That should be two minus. I trust that you got that right when I didn't. Next up then, let's do another titration calculation. This one presents a good challenge. This would be a harder A-level question or a pretty typical chem sheets question. Well worth practicing on for sure. Um, again, I'm not gonna give any hints. I've put a couple of pictures up there just in case you wanted some help visualizing what this might look like. Volumetric flask was used. They put this amount of solid into a solution, which was then in a volumetric flask made up to 250 cms cubed. The solid was a hydrated solid. It had some waters of crystallization locked away in the crystals. So within that formula, you've got C2O4 2 minus. It's called acid, it's oxalic acid. So those are H pluses, those two H's at the start. Dihydrate, two waters. They're, they're not gonna affect the chemical reaction. They're just present having mass in the crystals. So read the details of the question carefully. There are a number of steps here, which makes this a challenging question. Pause the video now, take your time over this one. I want you to have a really good go at it, hopefully get it right. Uh, but if not, then you can follow my answers through. So pause the video now. Okay, so on for the answers. Hopefully you've got something. That I'll give you a sort of sneaky hint. It's about 80%, obviously I'm being vague, that it's about 80% purity. So let's see uh, if you got all the way there. Right, so uh, balanced equation is good to go when we're ready for it. Uh, the moles of manganate are as such, that's just volume times concentration gives mole. This is in the titration, obviously, uh, which means that that reacted with 25 cms cubed worth of C2O4 2 minus, which was part of that H2C2O4.2H2O substance that got dissolved into 250 cms of water, cms cubed of water. Mole ratio applies here, so I took my moles of manganate divided by 2 multiplied by 5, uh, which gives us now, I'm not going to do any rounding until the end here. I'll make a comment about rounding at the end after that. 4.625 times 10 to the minus 3 mole. We're interested in the purity of the solid. 6.5 grams of impure solid went into 250 cms cubed of solution. We've only just titrated a tenth of that. We've just taken 25 cubic centimetres. So that's something that will become important in a moment. But let's answer question one first. The concentration of the solution then is just the moles divided by the volume, isn't it? So that's 0.185 moles per dm cubed. If you've got 0.085, you've got a bit mixed up with your factor of 10. 
We've just worked out the moles that was in that conical flask. Uh, so that's the moles in 25 cms cubed, so divide by the correct value. Now, as we said, uh, 25 cm cubed was just an aliquot. It was just a small liquid portion of, 20, of 250. So if we scale our answer, now you can do this in a number of ways. The route I'm taking into our answer here is taking the moles in 25 cm cubed and multiplying it by 10. So 10 to the minus three becomes 10 to the minus two. You'll get that same answer if you take the concentration, 0.185, and multiply it by 0.25 dms cubed. You'll get the same answer. That's how many moles got dissolved into the flask, which means that that many moles was how many moles of H2C2O4.2H2O there was in that six and a half grams. Now, um, you might be wondering, how can I just take that number and copy it when they're different formulae? Well, this oxalic acid dihydrate here has got one C2O4 unit in it, which is a C2O4 2 minus. So the moles of this is the moles of it with some other stuff added on. Next, okay, well, now that we've got the moles that was weighed in uh, to the flask, sorry, was dissolved into the 250 cms cubed, then we can multiply by MR. So I've got there the MR 126 well, grams per mole. If you ever put a unit on MR, it'd be that, because one mole of anything weighs its MR in grams. Uh, the moles in 250 cms cubed times its MR, so that's the mass. Now, I still haven't rounded. Uh, I'll do that at the very end. Um, percentage purity then? Well, 5.83 grams went in. 6.5 grams was actually what we put in, but th the rest was impurity. So that makes it about 89.7%. Sorry, it was close to the 19 and 18. My apologies. Hopefully, you did okay with that. But if not, hopefully, you can see how it works. We did a moles calculation with titration type values, so moles, voles, and conch. Then there was a factor of 10 just to catch us out, basically. Then there was a consideration of how we turn that into a mass and therefore a purity of the original mass. So that's all there is to say. Those are the two worked examples for redox titrations. You can see the sorts of calculations that you'll be working with, and you can see the sort of chemical reaction equations and the sort of mole ratios that you'll be working with. So that brings us to the end of the variable oxidation state section of the transition metals topic. We've still got a bit to go. We've still got quite a lot of thinking to do on catalysis and aqueous ions in solution. But then we are truly at the end of the course, which is nice feeling. So uh, go back over these videos whenever you need to. If you need to use the words examples, then do. Uh, and the next thing for you to do, next lesson for my class will be basically a lot of practice on these redox titration calculations. But we'll save that for next lesson.